So now I'd just like to go over some assessment tips that I have, which you may find useful to better handle the papers. So let's start with paper 1. The most important thing is to make sure you don't spend too long on each question. You have 1 hour and 30 or 40 questions, depending on your syllabus. That means you have roughly 1.5 or 2 minutes per question. So if you don't understand or can't figure out the question, just skip it first. If it's a topic you know you're not good with, for example, stoichiometry, just move on to the next question first. Time passes really quickly during paper 1, so it's important for you to keep your morale up and keep doing the questions. If you don't know how to do the question, just move on first and don't dwell on it so much. And don't keep thinking about the question when you're doing the other questions. Also, don't be too concerned if your answer is slightly different from the choices that you're given, especially if you don't have the time. So for example, your answer might be 80, but the nearest option to your answer might be 81. So in that case, just put that as your answer first and come back to do the question later. It's better to make sure you've tried to do more questions to get as many marks as possible instead of foregoing the questions behind just because you were so fixated on a question in front. So if you find that you tend to take more time to answer all the questions, maybe it takes you about 50 minutes to finish the paper, then start shading the boxes as you do the question instead of shading only after you finish the paper. If you shade only at the end when you finish all the questions, you run the risk of not having enough time to shake all the boxes and you'll actually be wasting a lot of your marks that you could have gotten. Now for paper 2, you have 2 hours to answer structured questions. So the questions are crafted such that they will guide you through the process. So if you cannot think of how to answer a certain part of the question, look at the previous and the next parts to see if you can get any hints on what the answer should be like. Make sure you answer the question. So for example, if the question is, why does titanium have a higher first ionization energy than calcium? In your mind, the first thing that comes to mind would be the number of protons and number of electrons and effective nuclear charge. So write your answer, and at the end of it, make sure you've answered the idea of first ionization energy which means that you should be talking about the amount of energy needed to remove the electrons increasing or decreasing. Don't just write everything that you know about the topic. The examiner should not be picking out the points that they are looking for in your answer. If you think about it, the examiner has a lot of scripts to mark, and if they have to be picking out points from your answer, they will be very, very frustrated. Use the number of marks allocated to the question as a hint to the amount that you need to write. So if it's a one mark question, try as much as possible not to have too many sentences. Your examiner will get frustrated. And if you start writing too much and you make a mistake in the concept, you might actually get marks deducted. So try and limit your answer to what is necessary only. Also, be very clear on the keywords that are important for the concept. For example, when you're answering questions on ionization energy, you should talk about the number of protons, which affects the nuclear charge, number of occupied principal quantum shells, which affects the shielding effect, and the combined effect of these two, which is the effective nuclear charge, which in turn affects the amount of attraction between the valence electron and the nucleus. Then you will talk about the ease of removing electrons, which affects the amount of energy needed to remove the valence electron, and hence the ionization energy will increase or decrease. So this is a very stepwise methodical process, and this helps to make sure that you will answer the question that they're asking. So when you are studying, please study smart. Don't just memorize paragraphs in your notes, but instead understand the key words that are important in the question. Be sure to pace yourself as well. So if you have, for example, five questions and two hours, you actually have about 24 minutes per question, assuming all the questions have equal weightage. So try not to spend more than about 20 minutes on each question. 
This will help to make sure that you have enough time to at least tackle all the questions so you can get the marks that are easy to get. For example, the things that you have memorized or the easier concepts. The worst scenario is that you don't have enough time to at least try all the questions. So if you cannot figure one part of the question out, move to the next part and see if it's something that you can answer without the previous part. Now for paper 3, the format of the paper is different depending on whether you are taking your A-levels this year or next year. For those of you taking it this year in 2016, the old syllabus consists of 5 questions out of which you need to choose 4. Don't spend a lot of your time choosing the questions. Just briefly go through the question and see if you can answer most of the parts. And if you can, just do the question. For example, if you usually score about 13 out of 20 per question, just to check the question and see if you can score between 13 to 15 marks. You only have 2 hours for 4 questions, which means you have about 25 minutes to 30 minutes per question. There is no time for you to waste to look at a question and decide whether you will score better for this question or that question. Because at the end of the day, you will probably have to do that question anyway. There's only one question that you can choose not to do. Don't be too hung up if you encounter parts that you don't know how to do. If you are already halfway through the question and you find out that you can't do the rest, you can consider moving on to the next question and then come back to the question once you are done with the other questions. See if you have time to start another question and if you don't, just finish the previous question as well as you can to get as many marks as you can. When it comes to the new syllabus, you have 3 to 4 free response questions as well as a choice between two questions. Once again, please don't spend a lot of time choosing the question that you want to do. Use the same strategy, briefly go through the question and if you can answer most of the parts, just do the question. Don't be too intimidated by the questions in paper 3. Odds are there will be things that you have never seen before. But at the end of the day, the basics that they are trying to test are not new. So you will really have the knowledge that you need or be given the information that you need. Calmly just go through the question and most of the time, I find that the more intimidating the question is, the easier it actually is to do. Now for paper 4, this applies primarily to the new syllabus because this is where your planning question will occur. So when you are writing your procedure and planning, be specific about the volumes and the capacity of the equipment where they matter. For example, if you want to use a beaker, state the capacity of the beaker. Do you want a large beaker, like a 500cm cube beaker, or do you want a small beaker, like a 50cm cube beaker? The best way to write the procedure is to imagine you are actually conducting the experiment. What will you need to do, and what will you need exactly? Just imagine yourself actually conducting the experiment during your practical and go through step by step what you will do. Try and make sure that each step of the procedure involves only one action. So for example, in step 1, you should have weigh the, a certain mass of the compound. Step 2 will be dissolve the compound in a certain volume of solution in a 50 cm cube beaker. Try not to combine them together. For example, in step 1, you have weigh a certain amount and dissolve it in a certain amount of water. That becomes very confusing. So now let me share some overall tips that are not necessarily specific to chemistry. First is to be consistent. For topics like math and chemistry, practice is important to make sure you have exposure to different types of questions. Chemistry also unfortunately requires some memory work like in organic chemistry and inorganic chemistry. So study it well and study it early. Be comfortable with keywords and concepts such that when you see the question, you immediately know what you should be mentioning. If you have any doubts, clarify them early and try as many different questions as you can, such as in your prelim papers or past year papers, so you know where your weak points are and you can work on them. For physical chemistry, revise the topics enough such that you are very comfortable with the concepts. For organic chemistry, be familiar with the reagents and conditions as well as the reactants and products. So what I did personally for organic chemistry 
was that we had flow charts with the reactants, the conditions, and the products. So I scanned the flow charts into my computer. In one copy, I erased all the reactants and products. And in the other copy, I erased all the reagents and conditions and printed them out and did them like about four or five times until I was so familiar with all the reactions that I needed to know. It sounds like a lot of work, but it actually works. So find a way to help you learn these reactions easily. For inorganic chemistry, try as much as you can to find the trends so you don't need to memorize too many things. The best way to learn is to do this yourself and not provide it to you by your teachers or your tutors because when you find the trends yourself, it, it will be easier for you to remember them. When going for any exam, make sure you arrive early because nothing sets you into a panic quite like arriving late for the exam. Also, try not to discuss new questions or concepts just a few hours before the exam. If it's something that you don't know how to do, you will start panicking about not knowing enough and that is not the state that you want to be going into the exam in. Also, if you talk too much to your friends, they might tell you things that are wrong. As a result, you might go in thinking the wrong things. So, study what you need to and be confident in yourself. It is very unlikely that memorizing something just minutes before the exam, outside the exam hall, is going to help you. So, instead of panicking and trying to memorize things before you go into the exam hall, try and calm yourself down and tell yourself that you are ready for the paper. If you've had a bad paper, give yourself some time to mope about it and then move on. Particularly during A-levels, you often have papers very close to each other. So you cannot spend too much time thinking that you screwed one paper over. You need to focus and study for the next paper to make sure you are ready for it. Personally, I never discuss the questions after I finish the paper. I, I don't like finding out about whether I've done the question correctly or not. Because even if you find your answers are different, there is nothing you can do about it. And instead, if you find out that your answers are different from your friends, it's not going to help your morale, which is important to keep up during the length of the A-levels. Also, don't burn yourself out. Make sure you have enough sleep so that you can maintain your pace during the A-levels. This is the end of this series of videos on A-level H2 chemistry. I really hope that you found this series of videos useful as well as the tips that I provided and that they will help you perform well in your A-levels. All the best for your papers and I hope you score well.